Hello, everyone, and welcome to the afternoon pre-conference for the 2024 Evergreen International Conference. My name is Taryn McKenna, and I'll be moderating all about scheduling evergreen upgrades and training for your library or consortium with your presenters, Gina Monti from Bibliomation, Elizabeth Davis from Pales, Spark, and Jennifer Pringle from BC Libraries Cooperative. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, without whom we wouldn't be able to do this. Mobius and Stat Courier were sponsors for the pre-conference sessions today. Equinox sponsored the platform itself. Uh, ECDI, the Evergreen Community Development Initiative, has sponsored the captioning. And Kipu has sponsored the Thursday Hackfest, and we hope to see you all there. If you have any questions, please post them in the chat. I'll be moderating both the feed loop chat and the Zoom chat, so either one. This session will be recorded, and I will post the captioning link in the chat in just a moment. And with that, I will stop sharing and turn it over to Gina, Elizabeth, and Jennifer. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, before we get started with our more formal introductions, we just wanted to mention that our um, approach to the presentation is more of a participatory conversational uh, approach. So as we work through all of the planning stages of rolling out an upgrade, uh, we'll be asking for your inputs as well. Um, obviously, not everyone does an upgrade the same way. And so we're very eager to hear about all the different ways that folks approach uh, an evergreen upgrade. So um, I will hand over, uh, Gina, I think you're first. Uh, sorry, did we decide on who's gonna do the screen share or not? Okay, I could do it if- uh, Okay. This one do one. I All can right. do it, just give me one- Sure, yep, no problem. Moment. Thank you, Jennifer. Cool. Okay, uh, so hi everybody. My name is Gina Monti and I work at Bibliomation, uh, which is a consortium based out of Connecticut. It is currently uh, the awful, awful springtime here. So that's probably I'm gonna sound nasally gross <laughs> during this presentation. Uh, but I'm happy that you're all here to also um, listen to our uh, experiences with upgrading uh, the system. So my uh, current role is the Evergreen Systems Manager. I've been uh, in this role I'm very fresh, probably just a few months. Um, but I was current. I was uh, previously rather the Evergreen Systems Specialist for about like four years or so. Uh, before I went into this role, um, I'm sure a lot like uh, all of you who are uh, with us today. I used to be a librarian, um, still kind of consider myself as one. And uh, I worked in youth services, reference uh, specifically with children. Uh, so I'd like to think that I had a well-rounded experience before I decided to move into a more technical role. Um, so uh, a bit about our consortium. Uh, we are in the Eastern time zone. Uh, so we are on the East Coast. Um, some of the states a bit coastal and some of it's a bit more inland. We're not very far from New York. Uh, currently, I would say uh, in our office, which is located specifically in Waterbury, it probably is like about an hour to get to New York State from driving uh, and a little bit longer to take a train into the city. And from Boston, probably about like the same. So we're like in a nice little in-between area. Uh, and apparently Connecticut is the um, halfway point between uh, the very famous rivalry between the Boston Red Sox and New York Yankees. So if, um, I'm oh, sorry, if there's an echo, uh, that is probably because the other tab is uh, not muted. So my bad about that. <laughs> Something I should have mentioned. Um, in any case, um, we have uh, 81 libraries that we serve. It's a pretty small small um, state uh, that's in the New England area. We have 68 public libraries, 10 of them being schools. 
Um, those are a little bit various. Some are middle schools, high schools, and elementary schools. Three special libraries. Uh, I believe the maritime um, <clears throat> area where it's like naval uh, history has like a special library with us. Um, and we have about like 13 staff members. So, um, you know, another thing to consider is you have to think about your staff and your resources when you are um, approaching an upgrade, which we'll get into. So um, I'd say right now I'm the only person in our department, though normally we do have two. We have the manager and myself in the Evergreen department. Um, and then we have a few help desk people, uh, also some people um, in different departments helping out in help desk as well. Uh, we have uh, one network uh, specialist. So uh, uniquely that individual, his name is John, uh, used to work in the Evergreen department. So a lot of our uh, working relationship is pretty tight, um, especially when we're going into upgrades because he also deals with like the packages of like what's need what needs to be uh, the prerequisites that's going into an upgrade, which we'll get into more details later. Um, and then we have um, our RT department, uh, director, members, uh, director of member services, um, someone who also works with our finances and our cataloging department, which we call net, uh, database services. So uh, we have um, a little over 1 million bibs. Uh, we actually talked about this before the uh, presentation and uh, the count that I have there is not including electronic resources. Uh, so <laughs> thank you, Jennifer, for giving me that tip before I presented those stats. Uh, and in addition to Evergreen, which services our consortium of the 81 libraries, we also um, have Fulfillment, which is the interlibrary loan system so that any... Uh, non-consortium members of Bibliomation can contribute to an interlibrary loan system that's based off of Evergreen that Equinox had uh, developed for us. Uh, so we call it also the statewide catalog and we also support that in my department. I think that's it for me. Thanks, Gina. So I am Jennifer Pringle. I am a co-op support and the training lead at the BC Libraries Cooperative. Um, and the BC Libraries Cooperative does more than just Evergreen. So Sitka is our Evergreen consortium, uh, but we also do websites for libraries. Um, we have licensing uh, for e-products that come through us, um, as well um, as the National Network for Equitable Library Service. Um, so servicing print disabled patrons in Canada. Um, we... As you uh, can see from the slide, uh, we span quite a bit uh, geographically. Uh, primarily, our libraries are in BC and Manitoba, with one in Ontario. Um, and we have 219 locations in total, um, which means we fall in the Pacific, the Mountain, the Central, and the Eastern time zones, uh, which can make uh, support uh, sometimes a little bit of a challenge. Scheduling meetings uh, is the big challenge. <laughs> We're currently running Evergreen 311.1-ish, um, and the ish is because we backported um, some bug fixes that hadn't made it into uh, Evergreen official quite yet when we were doing our upgrade. We currently have 71 public libraries, 15 post-secondary, 18 uh, K to 12 school libraries. Two of those are standalone. The rest are um, a school district. Um, and we have 13 special libraries. Three of those are government libraries and the other 10 are childcare resource centers. Um, so it's uh, been an interesting challenge working with them as their primary collections are things like costumes and uh, boxes of train pieces and other uh, not traditional library items uh, like those. Um, we have nine co-op staff who have, I'd say, day-to-day -day involvement in uh, Sitka's Evergreen. Uh, so we have four of us on frontline support. Uh, we have two people who are more on the data and data migration side. Um, to, uh, ever, we call them evergreen specialists on more of the tech side, um, and then our, uh, our manager as well. Uh, when I ran our stats, I got 4.3 million bibliographic records. I thought that was a little high with 4 million items attached, 
And then I realized that 2.5 million of those are e-records, which uh, makes a lot more sense. Um, and we've got uh, just over 207,000 uh, active patrons. Um, and we're considering active patrons, uh, somebody who circulated within the last three years. Um, and we had 3.5, and that's sorry, that should say 3.5 million uh, circulations in the last 12 months. Um, and one of the things that I think is possibly unique to us um, is we have three different reciprocal borrowing zones within our instance. Uh, so we have two separate ones in BC and then one in Manitoba. Um, and those libraries are doing interlibrary loan uh, within their zones through Evergreen. Um, as well within BC, we have a program called BC One Card uh, where anyone who has library service can take their public library card and their ID and get a card at any other library in the province. Um, and our libraries ship items back and forth uh, to return BC One Card returns. Um, so that's, uh, we use the opt-in functionality in Evergreen uh, quite a lot for the BC One Card. And passing it over to Elizabeth. Hi, uh, I'm Elizabeth Davis. I'm the Support and Project Management Specialist for PALES uh, within um, our consortia, which is SPARC. Uh, we're in Pennsylvania. We have 234 organizational units. Um, so it's kind of an odd mix of uh, systems and individual libraries. Uh, but of those, we have 180 public libraries, one academic, which is a, a community college, three schools and nine special libraries. And something that's a little different from us um, is that we're on uh, 311.5, but we're hosted by Equinox. So some of our um, upgrade workflows might be a little different uh, from our uh, co-presenters um, for obvious reasons, because we don't do some of that work, but um, doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of planning to, to put in as well. Um, we have three full-time staff. Um, like I said, I'm the support specialist, and then I have an executive director who helps with support, as well as a colleague, uh, a membership coordinator, Kat, who also does um, support. So we're kind of a, a lean, mean team, I like to say. Uh, we have roughly 1.7 million bibs with over 6 million items. Um, we are a growing consortia. We just added 26 libraries this year. Uh, so we're very excited about that. And um, I took the uh, active patrons a little differently. Uh, we have over 890,000 unexpired patrons. So as of the beginning of the year, um, and in 2023, we had 6.3 million circulations. Um, we also have a little bit different uh, structure where we are a limited resource sharing group. Um, so in that way, we don't share across the whole state but we have a small pools of uh, either within a system, uh, between systems and, and larger you know, sections of the state resource share. And we also utilize the fourth org unit tier, which is not as common uh, with evergreen installations. And finally, we're using uh, or beta testing uh, an INSIP use with our ILL state program. So we have a lot of connections to keep up with. So. Um, we're really kind of growing that area of um, the use of Evergreen as well. So I will pass it over to Jennifer. I'm going to start by unmuting myself. Um, so the first big question when thinking about an upgrade is why do you want to upgrade? Um, and we put this list together, talking amongst the three of us. Um, some of it is you want the new features that are coming um, or you want the bug fixes that are coming. Um, and with bug fixes, we wanna call out specifically accessibility fixes because especially with newer versions of Evergreen, there's a lot of accessibility fixes um, in those newer versions or uh, coming in the upcoming versions. Uh, 
One piece that is a consideration that uh, we make is we want to be in a supported version for security releases. Um, which is one of the pieces uh, as to why we normally do an annual upgrade. Um, as you're thinking about it, you know, do you want to be doing a minor upgrade or backporting bug fixes, or do you want to be doing a major upgrade every year? Um, and you know, or are you doing a minor upgrade and a major upgrade? Um, and there's advantages to staying in sync with others in the community. Um, one of the things I find interesting at uh, conference, the conference um, is you see when people are presenting lots of different, uh, you know, things talked about in different versions of Evergreen. Um, and sometimes the features that are being talked about, not everybody has depending on the version of Evergreen that you're currently on. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, so staying in sync with others in the community can be a, a big advantage, um, not just for the conference, but also for interest groups um, and being able to uh, really utilize the documentation for new features and such. Elizabeth. Um, I just want to add that um, we went from I think 3.7 to like 3.11 or 3.10. It is a significant change. And so to keep staff <laughs> uh, up to date with training and keeping up with all of those bug fixes and making sure that workflows were as smooth as they can be was uh, is always a major um, motivator for keeping upgrades, you know, within sync with other community members. So. It, it helps <laughs> when you're not jumping too far. And Gina, did you have anything to add on why you want to upgrade? Uh, I was just about to make a comment that go from 3.7 to 3.11 is a very brave jump. Um, and, and in some ways, I know for us, when we were, uh, I, I actually was hired around this time when we were migrating from Zool to the web client. Uh, we were behind uh, by a lot. I think the first version we were on with the web client was uh, three one six or something like that, and we had to go to like three five, then three six, and we did a three six to three nine. So when you're like a few uh, versions ahead, or rather, if you're going to make that jump, um, I'd say that in those cases for me, it probably has to go with everything that you said, uh, but. I also would like to just be on a supported version. So I think that's the only other thing I have to add to that, but that was well said, Jennifer. Thank you. And please, as we go through, as Elizabeth said at the beginning, um, please feel free to add into the chat. And I think people can mic in as well. Um, if there's any reasons to upgrade that we haven't touched on, um, is there something else that is one of the big reasons why you're library, your consortium decides, yes, we need to upgrade our evergreen version. And feel free to put things in the chat um, as they come to you as well. Uh, so I'm going to move us to the next slide and pass this over to Gina. All right, perfect, because I was about to say there was uh, another reason <laughs> I was going to come up with, but it'll uh, be relative to this slide. So. Um, Scheduling your upgrade could be uh, as daunting of a task as it is to actually do the upgrade itself because you um, don't want to give yourself too much time where a lot of things could get forgotten. And especially with how fast this community pushes out different releases, not even just like considering the major releases, uh, like 3.13 is going to be coming out soon um, as a beta release, I think in the next like two weeks or so. Uh, but correct me if I'm wrong on that, but it's going to be coming up like fairly soon within a month. Um, minor releases are also very important as well. So uh, the, the first bullet point of the slide, so like how often do you want to upgrade, I would say is probably like as equally as an important of like when to actually schedule it. Um, so if you have like a major upgrade versus a minor one, um, you have to consider if I have like this major release, like uh, Elizabeth going from an older example, three uh, seven to three eleven, um, 
that's a very big jump. So that's going to be a lot of new features you'll have to train your your end users on. Um, probably patrons as well, especially if there's differences in the OPAC. Uh, but minor upgrades also have some very important things in there too. Uh, and this uh, recent example, I just uh, did a minor upgrade on Saturday from 3.11.2 to 3.11.4 um, because actually, Taryn, you're the perfect person to be moderating this because of a, uh, a fix that you put in or rather wish list item that you put in with um, discovery layers or something like that. But that that was going to help feed into our uh, rollout project. So uh, in February recently, we went from 3.9 to 3.11 uh, mostly because uh, the, the new feature of HTML supported email templates. Um, but I was having some issues on uh, 3.11.2, which was the older version of trying to get like the images to link in there. And I really didn't want to do a whole bunch of um, file organization on the other end uh, when we could have something much more direct. Uh, so I reached out to Taryn and lo and behold that she uh, got uh, something that got pushed to 3.11.4. But because I did promise our consortium, uh, we're going to be rolling out these HTML emails uh, with this one caveat. I felt like it was appropriate to go to the minor version. Uh, sometimes it's because of security releases. Um, I know for us, we try to get the security release patches out as soon as uh, we can. So that does involve like a, a upgrade, even if it's minor. Um, but another thing too, is like, if you really don't want to schedule an upgrade, um, if you have a lean staff, if you are using... Um, an outside organization to help you. Uh, we at Biblia are very lucky to actually have in-house staff who can do these upgrades. And we do a uh, contract with Equinox um, if we do have like a question that comes up. Um, could you backport the bugs? Meaning could you um, put the code in uh, for the bugs as a commit to your code that's on production right now without having to go to another version, have to bring the servers down? It's a, it's a lot of time. Uh, the minor version that I just did on Saturday took two hours and 20 minutes, which I'd say is really quick. Uh, however, that's still two hours and 20 minutes that we have to schedule as like downtime and also off hours. So um, is backporting bugs, especially if they're um, like more front end things and make it like look a little bit better. Um, or if it's like a very major bug fix that you absolutely need to have in this version, you have to consider like what's going to work best for you in that case. Um so that will help you figure out how often you want to upgrade, uh, even if you just have like a timeline of like a year or so. I think a, a lot of us typically think about how how much do we want to upgrade in this year uh, and how upset do we want our end users to be when things change. Uh, but we'll get into that. We'll get into that. All right. Uh, so the next point of this is the upgrade date. Um, like I mentioned before, I won't spend too much time on it. it you know, you have to make enough time for training. Is this version you're going to go to going to have a lot of front end? Um, well, not front end, but like a lot of changes where your end users are going to notice, like, why is this like this? Um, even if it is a bug fix that's major, do you have time to do like some type of training, even if it's like something small? Um, sometimes there's a lot of back end fixes that comes between minor upgrades where, you know, I don't feel like we really need to. Uh, worry our end users that, uh, oh my God, another change is coming. And it's like really scary. Um, that's something to think about because, uh, you know, some, as we all are, um, like I just saw like Facebook is using like integrating AI meta into just searching. You just have to search for a name and meta comes up like that might, you know, um, uh, get some people like, oh, here's this change that's coming that I notice. Uh, I definitely did. So, um, you have to like think about if there's going to be enough time to train people and uh, ease them into the transition of like what's to come. If it's a major one, you might have to schedule it out uh, a lot later on uh, than what you're originally planning. If it's minor, um, you might have to be like a little bit more flexible, especially if it's going to help you complete a project, if it's going to be like important bug fixes that you need to put in, um, or if it's a security release. So you have to consider uh, for your end users what really needs to be trained, what needs to be communicated and put that into the equation of when to schedule something uh, with your upgrade. Uh, and lastly, for this part, all the upgrade pieces. Um, so I, I just put like a couple examples like training, uh, updating your test servers, getting the testing done, staff responsibilities, um, which we'll all get into uh, throughout this presentation. 
Um, you have to also consider that when making a date. Um, you know, how long does it actually take uh, on a test server to uh, do an upgrade? Um, and I put that uh, indifferent emoji in there because sometimes you don't, uh, you know, you, you have to actually just do it in order to know. Um, so you have to ask questions like that uh, when you're considering it. And, you know, how long does upgrade scripts take? That's another thing. Um, so when you're uh, thinking, it, this isn't so much in terms of like getting things ready for the date. It's more like on the upgrade day, because uh, for some people, it might be longer than one day or two. Um, if, if it's like a lot, especially if you're doing a lot of re-ingests with your uh, database. But do you have upgrade scripts that's going to like take a while? Um, so it is very important to test that out, but we'll get into specifics later. Okay, I think that's it for me for that slide. And one thing, uh, Gina, that you touched on a little bit, but I just wanted to um, bring out a bit more because it's a big consideration for us about you know, major versus minor versus do we backport is staff capacity. Um, and do you have with, you know, with all the other projects that your library consortium may be doing, do you have the capacity in your staffing to do a, both a major and a minor release or do a major release and backport? Um, and that could vary year to year um, as to what uh, is actually feasible for your organization. Very strong agree. Um, and so, as Gina said, you know, one of the first things you have to do is pick your date um, when you're scheduling. Um, and once you have that date, one of the key considerations is when do you start communicating that out to your libraries? Um, we find that, you know, there's a fine balance between not doing it too early um, so that, you know, people read the communication six, seven months out and be, you know, say, oh, that's happening six months down the, the road. I don't need to think about that yet versus communicating it too late. If you're doing a major upgrade, you probably don't want to let your libraries know four weeks ahead because um, there's probably some additional information that you need them to have that won't really fit in that four weeks. Um, so you need to find that, you know, spot of when is, you know, not too early and not too late. Um, and in our consortium, we do quite a bit of communication. So after we send that initial communication to announce that we're upgrading and that we've picked a date, there's additional communication that comes after that. Um, the upgrade date is one of the first things we communicate closer to the upgrade. Um, well, actually, sorry, when we communicate the upgrade date, we also communicate our expected downtime because um, we usually have a window that we expect we'll need. Um, but much closer to the actual upgrade is when we would um, communicate about the actual changes that are coming. Um, as well as training opportunities and resources and such uh, that will be available uh, for our libraries. Um, and for us, when we do training, we actually do, depending on the upgrade, our typical one is we will do four webinars that are all the same thing, um, but because we span four different time zones, uh, giving options uh, makes a big difference in whether our libraries can actually attend those. Um, so we do four different days, four or two different times across four different days. We usually have about 20, 25 people in each session. Um, and that one is just what is new. So here's the new features or the bug fixes that are going to change things that we think libraries should be aware of. We don't cover everything because it's not possible to cover everything in 60 minutes. Um, but we, you know, highlight the key things that are going to change how they work. Um, for some upgrades, uh, such as when we went to the web client, we'll do more. Um, we did, when we went to the web client, we also did a circulation 
session and a cataloging session because those interfaces were changing significantly from the desktop client. Um, this most recent, where we went to 311, we did an acquisition specific webinar as well um, because we were getting the big pieces with purchase orders and line items changing. Um, and then when we went to 3.9, we also did course reserves because that was the first time we were rolling out the integrated course reserves module. Um, so we did a specific one around that um, to get our libraries ready to start using it. Um, and based on what we're seeing in 3.12, what's expected in 3.13, um, and the fact that we're going to end up jumping, uh, I think, three or four versions for our next upgrade due to some uh, factors that have uh, pushed our 2024 upgrade into 2025. Um, I'm already anticipating that we're going to be doing multiple uh, specific webinars in addition to our general uh, what's new. Um, when we do uh, we do, when we do the webinars, the what's new one is typically about a month in advance for us. Um, so to give our libraries time to absorb the information, we also release a video that covers the same features because we know for uh, some of our libraries, uh, some of them are quite small and they don't have the time to attend a webinar. So we have that video so people can go back and uh, watch, uh, remind themselves of what they saw in the webinar, but also uh, so that those who can't take the hour out of their day to attend the webinar um, have something to watch and see what's coming. Um, and then uh, while we're doing this, uh, we're also sending reminders um, about the upgrade uh, because what we don't want to happen is for us to upgrade and somebody to say, oh, things changed. I didn't realize we were upgrading. <laughs> Um, so we have, yeah, communication. We try not to overload our libraries with communication, but I think we're sending about one to two a month between when we announce our date and when we actually uh, go live with the upgrade. And Elizabeth, did you want to? I, I was just going to add that um, we do kind of a very similar, like, announce the date and all of the formal wording, but then we kind of sneak it into like every conversation, every ticket that might relate like, hey, I know you're reporting this bug, but good news when we upgrade this fall or when we upgrade in like six weeks or, you know, we just kind of kind of chip away at it. Like, don't forget we're upgrading, we're upgrading, we're upgrading. It gets really annoying, but it seems to be helpful because, um, you know, it's, we're thinking about it all the time, but most library staff aren't. And that's a very good point, I think, around the communication, Elizabeth, is that, you know, we're thinking about the upgrade all the time. But as you said, you know, the library staff aren't because they have other day to day considerations, whereas our day to day sometimes becomes the upgrade. <laughs> um, Gina, did you have anything around communication that Bibliomation does differently? I don't think it's like really, really that much different because um Personally, and I know that uh, this is something that I try not to do uh, in my position, I hate, like, <laughs> I feel like I'm one of those people who, like, whenever I remind somebody, like, repeatedly that I'm just bugging them. But unfortunately, uh, especially, like, um, when it came to our 3.9 to 3.11 with the acquisitions interface uh, being angularized, for example, that one was probably, like, the most that we got in terms of, like, why is this different now um, after we communicated a lot? So uh, I think that Elizabeth is uh, right to be creative, like outside of just emails. You do have to find like other ways to do the very best you can. I mean, there's probably going to be like an outlier of a few people, especially if you're working with a very large amount of libraries who are going to be like, what, this change? I didn't know that. Um, so like try to get ahead of the curve. So. Uh, I'm I'm sorry to have like actually some ideas brewing in my brain right now. So as a presenter, I think that this uh, presentation has been <laughs> giving me a lot of really good things to think about so far. Uh, but yeah, yeah, you do have to find creative ways. 
All right, I'm going to take us to the next slide here and back to you, Gina, uh, to talk about your upgrade calendar. All right, sorry, didn't really click on mute. Okay, so this is uh, the fun part where we talk about what our uh, year looks like over at Bibliomation. And uh, in many ways, I like to kind of trip. I, I always, uh, as a kid, celebrated like Lunar New Year. Um, so I think it's funny that usually like our major upgrades are like kind of around that time. And it was on Lunar year, New Year this year. So my mom was like, how are you celebrating? I'm like, uh, I'm doing this major upgrade. <laughs> so you're the dragon. Let's go. All right. Um, so we usually try to look ahead to the next February. And um, like I mentioned earlier, much uh, my much earlier on in this presentation, um, for us to catch up from Zool to the web client took like a lot. And uh, I think it wasn't until 3.6 or like 3.9 really that we felt like, okay, we're actually kind of like on par with the community in terms of, you know, they're like a little bit ahead of us. So by like a few versions, we're just a bit behind. Um, so uh, we try to have like a major one, major one per year. Uh, just because I feel like that would make our um, end users uh, the most happy. Um, because we do have uh, a lot of very vocal staff who just don't like the change in the system. Understandable, uh, but you know we we do want to keep up with uh, all the needs that we have um, in our system uh, for making Evergreen just like better uh, and, and a much like more powerful tool. So uh, when we schedule a major upgrade, we try to like keep it around uh, the version that's coming out. Uh, so like. At this point now, I'm kind of thinking about, are we going to go to 3.12 or 3.13? Uh, so sometimes we kind of like let it go a bit where there's like some general feedback of like what's going on before we go ahead and schedule it. Uh, but the nice thing about scheduling early, like uh, around this time of year, um, is like you can change like what your benchmark is going to be for like, okay, which version do you want to go to? So I always think ahead to the next February, even like that day uh, on February 11th, I think was when I upgraded. I was already thinking about like what I'm doing the next year. You don't have to be uh, like that, but you know, um, it, it might be good just to like kind of keep it in your head. And then as time progresses, uh, you can make a decision on which version you want to go to. So uh, in the late summer is usually when I like to prepare the major version upgrade to a test server, um, kind of like what Jennifer said with communications. Uh, you don't want to do it too early because if you do like a big uh, change on your test server, especially if it's like a clone of your production server, um, and you do this like, so I we're on like 3.11.4 right now. If I made this test server 3.12 and did all this work to prepare for it, just to have 313 come out sometime later, that's a little bit more relative in the timeline than I basically have to redo everything that I was doing if I'm cloning it from production. So around summer, I'd say is like when I get that um, started. Um, around this time, I also talked to uh, John, I mentioned him before, uh, networking services to talk about, okay, what kind of uh, packages and prerequisites do we need to make this um, possible? Um, so it might have to be updating the Ubuntu uh, operating system. Uh, you know, there's this whole thing about Redis now. So uh, big conversations about that um, going on, I think still ongoing. Um, so sometimes you do have to like to wait a bit, but it's also important to understand like what you actually need and what's required for your servers to run before you do your install and your code prep, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so in the fall is when we do uh, like more focused testing. Of course, there's always testing along the way, but like we really dedicate fall to, we're going to test uh, a lot now. Um, and for, during testing, especially if we're going to go with uh, new features, that's a great time to get your documentation going. Even if it starts off as notes, you could go ahead and polish that up a bit later on. Uh, so I just prep the documentation around this time. Uh, we have a steering committee at Bibliomation. This is basically like our UI, UX type of group. So um, we try to uh, nominate certain librarians from different areas. So not just people who work on CERC. We need people who work in acquisitions, uh, who, who know the catalog well. Uh, children's librarians are also very important because they might be using the system for different things. Um, we would love to have uh, someone from a school on board. Uh, but it's a little bit hard to get in touch with people. Uh, if I understand, it's a more condensed uh, type of work year for them. Uh, but we try to be very uh, various with it. 
uh, it's just so we can try to touch every corner of the system as is. Um, and then we go ahead and give them like a mock presentation of like, these are new features, um, which we kind of keep on our hat, like what worked well in this demo, what didn't for like webinars. Um, and then they go ahead and start testing on their own. Uh, we usually give them like a, a choice of like what interfaces a test. So they're not just stuck with like, do everything. <laughs> like, do you want to do self-check? Do you want to do offline circ um, outside of like circulation and uh, OPAC searching? Things like that. Um, and then we upgrade our other test servers. So we have a multiple servers. Uh, I usually try to do one designated one that has like all the code prep stuff on it. And we'll talk about that later. Um, and then I have like a few other designated test servers to like also run the upgrade on. Um, and then I have like one that's safe for like uh, a test production install. Uh, but we'll go over that too. Um, in December, uh, that's when we have our scheduled webinars, or at least we try to schedule the webinars then, because uh, I try to keep the webinars like a month or two before the actual upgrade, just to kind of keep it a little bit fresh. Uh, again, touching base with what Jennifer said before. Uh, then I make a formal announcement. Um, at this point, like we're trying to foster a culture of an expectation that February is going to be when we're going to have this upgrade because nothing's really going on at that point. We don't want to do it in the summer uh, where something could potentially go wrong. And summer reading, of course, is like that. That's a big time for circulations. Uh, but usually like that February times when not too many things are going on. Um, and uh, not, not a lot of like libraries uh, might have like, um, they might be closed a little bit earlier than maybe like summer hours. Uh, it looks like Taryn said we moved hours in February this year and it worked really well. Okay, awesome. So I'm glad to know that there's another Februaryan out there. I like that. Let, let's call ourselves Februaryans. <laughs> All right. So uh, the documentation that I mentioned before, uh, that's when we polish it up and publish something. And uh, I, there, there's going to be more uh, to talk about with documentations with our other presenters. So I won't touch too much on it. January, don't ask why I put a wine emoji in there. I honestly just didn't know what to put in. Like that. that's when we celebrate New Year's, right? Like you know, actual New Year's, I don't know. So uh, in any case, um, that's when we typically try to have our webinars. Um, December is just like too iffy, the holidays, and uh, not a lot of people like are around. So January is usually a good time to get people when they're back in and refreshed. Um, we do a test production version of the upgrade on test server, like I mentioned before, and any last minute tasks that um, I'll touch upon later. So that's our schedule. And I am done with this portion of it. Okay, so for Pales and well, Spark, uh, we kind of do it on the polar opposite. Uh, we start in late spring. So around this time, we start looking at our, um, when the next version is going to be released. Um, and we kind of talk with our hosting provider, Equinox, and figure out um, if we can go from, so we're on 3.11 now, but we're anticipating going to 3.13 in the fall. So um, they usually like us to wait until there's a, a point one release, but um, so we hope by then there will be one. Uh, so we kind of get our date set for, for November. We are, again, like Gina explained, uh, getting building in that expectation that we're going to be upgrading at the same time every year. Um, I like to say, remember, remember, we always upgrade in November. It doesn't have to be the same week. It doesn't have to be the same day. It's just in November, early November. That's when we like to do it, just so that people kind of get used to it. Um, I would love to do February, but we have an annual report process that usually takes over all of February. So I think people would mute me if I made them upgrade in and do annual reports in February. Um, so we once we get the date, um, we have our major version upgrade uh, to our, we have two test servers. Uh, we have our secondary test server loaded with that upgrade and the pale staff will go through and do all the testing of new features and functions and start preparing documentation based on um, that testing. Just enough to, uh, like Gina suggested, just notes, just main points um, that we can, uh, polish up later and just uh, making sure things work as expected. 
And then in the later in the summer, early fall, we uh, reach out to our users group members um, and kind of ask for volunteers to uh, be part of our testing. And we go through the process and we show them everything that's going to be updated. And we provide them uh, with a list of tasks with the, with the um, with the documentation that we've prepared thus far for that workflow or a new feature or bug fix, um, kind of a, an unwieldy spreadsheet, which I'm rethinking entirely, but for now that's how we're doing it. Uh, we get testing notes and make sure things are working um, as they anticipate. Uh, we are kind of a, a larger consortium that have quite a variety of workflows, um, some that we are always learning how uh, new, new ways that people are using a function. Uh, so the testing has been very helpful to have them use do those workflows. Um, then uh, we start scheduling our webinars. We have webinars set up more towards um, kind of like work functions. So we have a circulation one, we have a cataloging one, and then we have like a, a third or fourth one, depending on how many upgrades and bug fixes in, in a specific uh, like arena are happening. Uh, we have them live and then we also record them. And then we tie that to all of our documentation online. So if people are looking for a specific bug fix, they can find that individual. And then we kind of timestamp it and say, here's us demoing it in, in this part of the video. Um, we make our additional formal announcements, you know, kind of getting people excited about it. Uh, again, still late fall or early fall, late summer. Uh, we have our documentation and webinars in September. Um, because in October, we have our statewide conference. So a lot of people are attending that. So we usually use that as an opportunity to, to highlight fixes and features and things like that. So uh, we have a captive audience. So we want to make sure um, people are aware of it. And then in November, we, we do the full upgrade. Um, and by we, I mean <laughs> Equinox does it for us. Uh, we don't have a ton of downtime. So we're very grateful for that. Um, so but what we do do a little differently is we have post upgrade refreshers. So we go back and we say, hey, here are the things that upgraded. Um, we have another set, round of webinars to review them, making sure again that they're working the way that people are anticipating, uh, filing new bugs um, and or fixes uh, to um, things that have come up since you know the, the upgrade. So um, that's us. That's how we do it. I'll hand it over to Jennifer. So we do it a little differently. Um, our upgrade moves around a lot. And I actually uh, looked at it. We've done 14 upgrades. Uh, our first upgrade was to 1.6. And we've done upgrades in April, May, June, July, August, and October. Um, over the years. So you can see our ours moves quite a bit. Um, we've had different factors. Uh, after doing an upgrade at the end of August, we will never do August again. Um, it just it kind of killed everybody's summer vacation plans, it turned out. <laughs> um, but we somehow at times have things that come up that just necessitate particular timing. Um, and as our consortium has grown and the different types of members have grown as well. Um, for example, uh, with September, we would never do, like we're never ever gonna do an upgrade in September because we have a lot of post-secondary and school libraries. And you know the time that they're spending getting ready for their school year, starting their school year, you know, two weeks into that, we can't say, surprise, here's all these new features. Um, so we found that end of October, uh, the last few years that we've done that um, has been a good time for them as well as for our other libraries. Now, our SIG upgrade calendar here is what we would typically do. Um, this coming upgrade is going to be different. Uh, we are in the process of migrating all of our servers for the entire co-op. 
Um, so instead of doing an upgrade in 2024, we're going to be migrating the consortium to our new servers um, and then doing an upgrade in 2025. Uh, so usually we'd be looking about nine to 12 months out to schedule that upgrade internally. Um, but this year we've already you know, said spring 2025. Um, we don't know exactly when in the spring, um, but yeah, so we're already looking a little further out than uh, the normal because we picked that, I think, back in February. Um, generally, about nine months out, we get a test server with the in-between version. Um, we're not doing full testing on that because as Gina um, said, you know, if you are planning to go to 313 and you have a 312 server and you do all of the testing on 312, you then have to do all of the testing on 313 as well. Um, so we have the in-between version more for us to take a general look at and see, you know, are there new big features that we want to start testing a little bit? Um, and have a better idea of what's coming. Uh, sometimes we also flag features that we want to see how they're working in the in-between version um, to see whether or not we need to pay attention or, you know, look at fixes for those features to actually be functional for us in the next version. Um, so there's a, you know, every now and then there's things that we're like, okay, is this one going to work for our consortium, especially based on uh, a lot of the scoping that we need? Um, and at the same time as looking at that in-between version, we'll be looking at the release notes and Launchpad to see what's coming, um, as well as you know, starting to see what's expected to come in the next release. So I'm already looking at 3.13 being like, okay, what do we think is actually going to make it in? Usually about four to five months out, we'd up announce our upgrade date. Um, because our library, like because our upgrade date fluctuates from year to year, um, we do try to do that four to five month um, announcement uh, because we don't have that same, you know, the upgrade is always in February or the upgrade is always in November um, for our members. Um, and once the version that we are expecting to upgrade uh, to is released, um, then we'll get a test server with that version as well as all of our customizations. We don't have a ton of customizations um, anymore. Uh, we've tried to make sure that things that we had customized uh, have made it into Evergreen main as much as possible so that we don't have to maintain those ourselves. Um, but we do still have some customizations. Um, and then we'll start testing that version as I think Gina said, but it might have been Elizabeth. Um, we also at this point try to go to the point one version. Um, we have gone live with uh, the release candidate and point O oh with uh, backports before. Um, and going waiting for point one and going to point one. Um, is often a lot easier and there's a lot less surprises after the fact. And then two to three months out, uh, we're announcing the webinars. Um, that sometimes depends on um, how many webinars we're doing. Um, if we're just doing the one what's new webinar, um, then we're announcing that about two months out. Um, if we're doing the specific webinars for different features, um, Sometimes we'll do those three or four months out, depending on uh, when those are being scheduled for. We're continuing testing and um, our testing is all done by co-op staff. Um, at this time, we don't bring any of our members in for the testing. Um, we're also starting to work on prepping our documentation and resources. Um, and some of that is, you know, literally I put the table of contents of our documentation out and I highlight the sections that are going to change, um, that are going to need that documentation change so that we have, you know, the big overall picture of how much work are we going to have to put into the documentation. Um, and around that time, we're also contacting some of our third party vendors 
um, because we have some vendors who need quite a lot of notice. Um, some vendors don't need that, um, but uh, for example, uh, I think Biblio, uh, not sorry, not Bibliomation, Biblio Commons um, asks for three months notice before a major evergreen upgrade. And then one to two months out, we're doing those webinars, we're putting the uh, what's new videos out, uh, we're continuing testing, and then uh, for the upgrade weekend, and you can see celebration is the uh, one I chose there. Um, we're doing our, our upgrade. Usually our window is, uh, we take things down at 9 p.m. on the Saturday, um, 9 p.m. Pacific for us. Um, and say that we will be back up by, I think it's 5 a.m. on Monday. Usually we're back up sometime on Sunday, um, but with the size of our database, usually it's about uh, uh, so overnight Saturday for running the upgrade. Um, and then we do um, testing on Sunday to make sure everything's working before we officially flip the uh, switch. Um, and we have had times in the past where once we're live on production, uh, things have come up that didn't show up in our testing environments because of the differences between our testing environments and our live um, our live setup. Uh, so we'll, we always like to test ahead um, rather than just flip the switch and say, uh, go for it. Um, and I think at this point, we are now going to uh, take a break. And we are going to come back to that slide after because we are, uh, I'm going to say 1.30, but it's actually, what time is it on the East? It's, it's, a, it's about like 4.27 right now. There we so, go. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to take a page from the acquisitions group that was before us and say, uh, we're going to take uh, like a 13 minute break and be back at 240 to uh, have us starting on a nice round number. And sorry, that is 440 for those of you yeah. uh, in the East. We'll reach a 40 of some kind. Yeah. <laughs> um, and please, if you've had any questions that have come up from the first uh, half of this, um, please don't hesitate to put them into the chat and we can address any of those um, uh, after the break. Thank you.
art, I am seeing 140 Pacific, which will be 440 Eastern. So we're going to dive back into upgrades. And I have adjusted our slides. So if I click, there's our next one. Take it away, Gina. Very fancy. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, so this is kind of like a, a bit of a more detailed thing that I wanted to do is scheduling your upgrade. Uh, there's a lot of like, well, when we were putting these topics together, I just found that there was like a lot of small details with like each type of like a uh, topic. So we're expanding on this a little more. Uh, so as I mentioned before, uh, the, you have to check your system resource requirements. So um, uh, just to kind of recap, what kind of operating system that you're running on for your system, uh, like what kind of Ubuntu uh, version that the like we run on, uh, what version of Postgres that you're running uh, for your database. Do you need to upgrade OpenSurf? Uh, you know, what's going on with uh, Redis and uh, other like types of system requirements like that you have to consider when you're scheduling your upgrade. So um, I don't really uh, work in that type of capacity as um, our networking uh, specialist here does, but um, uh, we we basically have to like work together. Usually, like when a major upgrade comes out, I look at the release notes. I kind of just send it to him and say like, okay, what what do you expect is going to be like reasonable amount of time for you to to do all these things. So, um, luckily, those uh, system resources are a little bit easier to deal with. You can kind of like do them uh, well depending on like what your infrastructure looks like. Uh, but typically, our networking specialist is able to at least like get those done at you know whatever his pace is, and we really won't like affect too much. Uh, so when you do your upgrade itself, like the upgrade day, uh, it's been mentioned before, you have to consider the downtime that you have to schedule for it. Um, uh, Jennifer was talking about um, how big her consortium is with their libraries. And uh, you saw like how many bibs that all of our consortia has, but especially if you're working with a big like uh, sample size, uh, like Jennifer's, you have to think about, well, if I have to run upgrade scripts, which I personally think takes the longest, um, usually we, at least with us, and I'd say that we're kind of like on the smaller or the bigger end of the small like uh, size of consortium, uh, we have to think about like, how long is it going to take? Do we have to like run this overnight? If you do run it overnight, uh, then that puts a, a big difference in what your schedule is so for us we try to do them saturday night into sunday if there are things that we can run separately outside of the upgrade itself like re-ingest for example we'll try to find like another day to do that uh, so you do have to consider that um, you also have to consider off hours for the upgrade itself um, you know people have families people have lives they have birthdays and all kinds of cool stuff that they want to do, like a food truck or I don't know, like something that like if there's something going on that weekend, uh, you know, you have to consider like your own schedule, especially if it's a, like a holiday. Um, <clears throat> so think about that as well. And uh, like who is even available? Um, I have been doing the upgrades on my own uh, throughout like the last couple but I always have like someone who's like willing to be offhand during that time in case like a question comes up or I need like a big favor and they'll just like come in and, and help me out on the project. Um, so if you do it as a team, even better, uh, but you have to consider those things. Uh, and you also have to think about what can be done before the upgrade day uh, that could contribute to the upgrade itself. Um, so I'll, I'll touch upon this later, but uh, usually I like to clone my repos beforehand, uh, check the config files, um, modify any scripts that need um, modifying. And scripts, I guess, is like a very general term here because uh, and this is where things get like technical. If you have like certain scripts, like I don't know, EG start or like autogen or something, um, they're like a bit more common from system to system, sure. But maybe you have custom scripts that someone put in or you put in yourself um, that's upgrade related that actually might not need to be run anymore just because it's uh, obsolete with whatever version was uh, in the past. So um, you have to look at those scripts too and see like how you could um, just basically optimize your time. And uh, also like do like a list of uh, diff Postgres scripts. Um, just get like a, a list of diff files for that. Uh, save somewhere so that could save you some time. So those like there are some examples that you can do to save time on upgrade day because 
you know, uh, time is really actually of the essence during um, upgrade times, especially if you're doing them off hours. Uh, you want to do the best that you can to optimize. Okay, Elizabeth, I think that's you now. So you've uh, scheduled your upgrade, you've started your communications, and now it's time to test. Everyone's favorite part of an upgrade is the testing. So um, we, these are some of the questions that we kind of talked through when we were uh, planning our presentation. And some of them we've kind of already touched on, but um, we'll go through them anyway. Um, so how do you approach your testing your upgrade? Um, here at Pales, we do a kind of a combo. I think Gina also said they do a combo where you have staff who do like the first round and then you have your end, front end users do additional testing um, for their individual workflows. Um, that's, uh, it works for us in Pales, but uh, as Jennifer pointed out, uh, at Sika, it works really differently for them. And so it works better for the staff to do all their testing. So. Uh, there is no wrong or right way to do it. It's just whatever works best for your consortia. Um, and then how do you plan and coordinate all that testing? Um, like I said, we use a, a massive spreadsheet, which I would love to get away with away from and use something a little bit more structured because um, not everyone's brain thinks like a spreadsheet um, like mine does apparently. Um, so, and then coordinating with all of your volunteers. Are, are you assigning them individual tasks? Are you having them test specific bugs? Are you um, having them do their daily workflows and making sure any and all of those things are working as they anticipate? Um, <clears throat> and then how are they communicating back to you about what isn't working and what level of troubleshooting are you getting involved in when uh, you're testing those um, and coordinating that testing. Uh, are you considering your browser recommendations? Are you testing on a, a new computer on a new browser that you don't normally use? Or are you using um, the same setup that you use on production? Um, I know a lot of, for us, even within the Pales organization, we all have different uh, browser plugins. Um, and all of those fun things and adjustments and settings um, that we have to take into effect and account. Um, but we find that having all of those day-to-day -day you know, plugins working in the same browser when you're doing your testing is pretty op optimal, I think. You know, you're getting um, an odd combo of things. It kind of stinks when you run into a bug and you're like, is this because of the plugin or is this because of something within the software or the browser? Um, so that makes it a little tricky, but it does in the long run help because you're going to run into those uh, workflow issues um, in at individual libraries as well. Um, some libraries only support specific browsers. I think when we spoke about this, it seemed the main two were Firefox and Chrome, but obviously uh, library staff uh, have a whole plethora of choices to make. So. Um, making sure you kind of know your uh, testing environments is very helpful. Uh, do you participate in Feedback Fest and Bug Squashing Week? Um, I think if you are going to be participating in those, that is a crucial part of your upgrade. It'll really help you define and decide if you're going to be upgrading to that version or are you going to, you know, participate and find, you know, I really don't think this is going to work for us. This is going to be a deal breaker, this specific bug, if it doesn't get fixed or can't be fixed in time. Uh, do you change your schedule for your upgrade? Do you push off and wait? Um, that type of thing. Um, and by participating in those, those activities, you kind of get a sneak peek uh, again at what's to come and play a, a role in how it gets developed. So um, for all of those small workflows or um, you know variations on a workflow, it helps to participate in that and see if it works for everyone. Um, we also talked about features. Um, you know, when do you use them? When do you decide not to use them? And when do you delay implementation? For Pales, we kind of go in with uh, the approach where 
we use everything that's stock and then anything that's new, unless it's a bug fix, we kind of wait a little while before implementing. Um, one example being, um, we were very excited about the uh, lost days for renewals, which I can never explain in a succinct way, but where you can add to your um, circulation policies so that when you renew early, you can add those days back, that any the days you lost. Um, and we had a few libraries that were very excited, but we said, you know, let's wait a week or two, make sure everything is working okay with your regular circulation policies before we decide to change all like 85 of them <laughs> and uh, adjust them for this new uh, feature. So that, you know, it, you don't have to do it that way, but we do find that as you, if you ease into an upgrade, things tend to go a little bit smoother. And then the new shiny things are just as new and shiny if they wait a week. And it's more impactful when everything is working correctly. Um, conversely, if you hit a bug and, you know, oof, it grinds you to a halt and you're just like, well, did you mean does doesn't work for us? So we're going to have to turn it off. Um, Tina, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, uh, can I make a comment about um, the renewal delay? Oh yeah, if you can because come up that, with a that, better way to explain yeah, it. I'm not really sure like how you're supposed to like, uh, I know that the release notes had a good name for it, but I just don't remember. Um, that is an incredibly good example of a feature that would be very beneficial to libraries and they would love that. But when you try to explain it, it's like so hard um, mm -hmm. because you have to consider like all the time that's involved because you're adding in like you don't want like people to gain the system. I, I, all right. So there's like a whole yeah. philosophy with it. Um, so uh, the nice thing, I guess, about like the documentation sharing portion of it, um, uh, Daniel from OWWL, sorry, owl. I, I don't owl. just owl. I wasn't mm -hmm. sure if it was actually pronounced owl. So Daniel, I'm sorry if I uh, did that incorrectly. Um, actually shared uh, with me how um, they were able to explain it through like a diagram. Um, and even the diagram was so like, you know, like a lot. Um, and because it is by circulation policies, of course, it's going to be like a, a long implementation that probably had to be a rollout. Uh, but yeah, I just wanted to make a comment that that was like probably one of like the more complicated features to try to translate to like end user speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you have that link, that would be awesome to share because I am endlessly looking for an easier way to explain it. No so. problem, because I stare at that like once a week. So <laughs> I'll send it to you. I got you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, deciding when you're going to use it, if you're going to use it at all, um, and um, delaying implementation. So these are all factors that you want to consider when you're looking at your fixes or your new, sorry, new shiny things uh, that people are excited about. Um, and then conversely, how do you deal with blockers? Like you've gone through your testing, you've gotten to the point where you think you're ready to go and you hit something that's like, well, that ACK functionality just isn't gonna work for us and we're gonna have to wait. Um, we have not had that happen yet, knock on wood, um, here at Pales, uh, but Jennifer, I know you folks kind of had that, that. We've run into a few blockers that have kind of stopped us in our like testing phase of if this can't be fixed we might not be able to go but as far as I can recollect we've always managed to fix it or somebody else has come up with a fix ahead of our go live um because and there was one uh one with acquisitions that we didn't catch until our libraries were using it um in 311 that we then got a fix for within a day or two um which affected just a small number of our acquisitions libraries um but would definitely have been one had we found it in testing that was a we have to fix this or we can't use acquisitions in 311 mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, it's, I think also looking at bugs ahead to think about what could be a blocker, um, because there's been a few things around the staff catalog, the, the angular staff catalog. Um, we had that one in acquisitions and I 
there was something else we encountered at some point where we, or um, circulation policies. Um, there were some where we were looking at and we were like, if this one makes it in, or if this feature, you know, doesn't get this fix, we can't switch the button, you know, switch the mm -hmm. version. Um, I will uh, just go back to the delaying implementation of features, uh, just mm -hmm. to make a comment um, that one other consideration that we sometimes make is staff capacity for actually rolling out the feature. Um, an example of that is the HTML notices um, that we've mentioned before, uh, because we did our last upgrade in October 2023, and we just announced those. We had two pilot libraries that we offered it to early, but we just announced that uh, in March as something that libraries uh, could opt into um, because every library that opts in, every notice has to be updated. Um, so we, you know, held off on that until we knew we were going to have a window where somebody was actually going to have the time to go in and make the needed changes um, for that. Yeah, that's a good point. Because up to the point when you're, you know, you're preparing for the update, you're, everybody's doing their tasks, then it's uh, quite busy. So yeah, having that staff capacity is important. Um, and then finally, um, how do you test custom settings? Um, do you have language translations that you have to make sure get ported over correctly? Do you have custom scripts that run or custom settings that you know you have to reset when you upgrade every time because they're not stock? Um, how do you test those and make sure that they're working um, as you need them to? Um, <clears throat> We don't, we have a few scripts, but they're not anything like life. <laughs> you know, they're like not quality of life. They're, well, I guess they're more quality of life. They're deleting bibs and uh, things like that. So um, we, we haven't encountered anything super specific like that. But uh, Jennifer, I know you folks work with translations often. Uh, yeah. So with the translations, it's always trying to get the new strings for um, translating and actually get French translations and get them back in before the version that we're going to. Um, some years were more successful than others. Um, and we, at this point, um, were just focused on translating the public catalog so that it's available in French and English um, for our users. Um, one thing that I didn't think about while we were uh, planning this session as far as like testing custom settings is when we went to 3.9, we went from TPAC to Bootstrap and all of our libraries have individual skins. And I know this is not, uh, you know, some li some consortia have this, others don't. Um, so we had over a hundred skins that needed to be checked to make sure that they actually still looked correct. Um, and for that, we actually rolled out a list and told our libraries, um, take a look, tell us if it doesn't look right, um, because a hundred different public catalogs uh, is a lot to look at for custom <laughs> settings. Yeah, we have a couple of those as well. Everybody has their own colors and things, but there are a few that have specific wording on pa specific pages, like the... Um, no results page, some libraries redirect or have links to like purchase request forms or ILL forms. And um, some of our libraries have um, custom wording for the self-registration form. So um, that's something that we always have to, we have a checklist item for that. So going through and making sure all those are included is, um, like you said, it's a lot. <laughs> well, and for us, one of the big pieces was that moving from the TPAC to bootstrap and looking at it on mobile de uh, mobile devices as well. Some of our libraries, their logos didn't mm. um, adapt well. Um, so we actually yeah. had to get some libraries to give us different sized logos or different, con you know, rather than a long logo, give us a square one um, for their, their public catalogs to actually be usable on a mobile device. Yeah. 
I think when we upgraded, we upgraded and then we waited a month or two and then we upgraded the, to Bupac. So that was one of those delay, delay of the implementation on that one. In general, we tend to be like, all right, we're moving to this. We're turning this off. Um, <laughs> we did that with the staff catalog as well. We upgraded. We turned off the traditional catalog with the upgrade and um, said, OK, we're now on the staff catalog. Let us know if you have questions with, you know, free training yeah. and all the resources. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, for big features like that, we tend to just cut everything over in one go. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> Gina, did you have anything you wanted to add to testing? <laughs> with testing? Um, <laughs> I guess like one, well, it's just uh, screen sizes is like one that kind of gets like forgotten a lot. So um, I'm glad that you mentioned the mobile uh view of it um you want to make sure that you know um i know for us like we uh did a, a few customizations in uh bootstrap where we try to like uh condense a lot of those menu items from iopac into like one button down uh so we had to be considerate of that uh if we do anything with links we have to be considerate of what that looks like on mobile too um so uh honestly like your your console tools and your browser um offers that at least on chromium based ones so uh you don't have to like pull it up on your phone all the time but it might be a good idea to like maybe invest in like a tablet or something and also like try out different screens um one recent thing that we found uh was and I know that Jay and I actually looked at this uh, before um with the addition to the circular uh, circ sorry circulation experimental um, it kind of like outstretched that top banner. And if you're looking on like an angular screen, uh, if you're looking at like a in-house use, for example, and you're working on like a laptop size screen, um, it actually like kind of condenses things down too. So there, there's a few things in like uh, displays that, it, you know, the front end part of this is going to be like very um, helpful for that way. But you also might want to look at um, shortcuts too. I know that our library... Uh, didn't like how the shortcuts went to experimental uh, circulation instead of regular. So um, there's always like small things that happen and sometimes you just don't catch all of it. I think there's no way to catch all of it. <laughs> Sorry, Elizabeth. I don't Go think ahead. so either. Oh no, I'm just, we, we found bugs later. Like after we upgraded, people were like, wait, why didn't they fix this? And it's like, oh, I didn't even... No people use that button anymore. I'm so sorry. So, so yeah. So testing is fun, but it's you're never going to be finished. So you do the best you can. And we just have a comment in the chat um, about using the inspector function in browsers to uh, simulate different devices and screen sizes, et cetera, which is a, a good suggestion to use during testing thank you yeah i always just call them uh console browser tools because i think inspect is like looking at a specific thing um but i also work on brave so i'm not really sure how different that might be for other browsers all right um for anything for final on testing elizabeth or shall we move on to training I I think we're ready to move on. Um, and just in the comment, or sorry, in the chat, uh, yeah, labeled inspect in both Firefox and Chrome. Okay, gotcha. You. Um, so training. So we've touched a little bit on um, the webinars and such that uh, our different organizations do when we we're talking about our schedule. Um, so I won't. Uh, go back to that because I think all three of our organizations have talked about uh, what we do webinar wise. Um, but it's not just the training sessions and um, for the new features, a big part of your training and resources is your resources. Um, for us, um, we spend a lot of time updating things or getting ready to update things in anticipation of our upgrade. Um, and over the years, the different resources that we have have expanded. 
Um, so we're updating our evergreen documentation. Uh, we maintain a separate acquisitions manual for evergreen because um, only some of our libraries use acquisitions. Um, we have a getting started site um, where libraries can go for the very basic, here's how to check in a book, here's how to check it out, and here's links if you want to know how to deal with all the exceptions, but this is the very basic information that you need to get started, um, as well as FAQs, and we also have a catalog help site, so we have the help link in our public catalog, which takes users to a, um, a catalog help site. Uh, some years, there's only a few tweaks to that. Uh, when we went from TPAC to Bootstrap, that entire uh, site needed to be updated. Um, and for us, uh, some of uh, for our manuals, we use Git for version control. So we can be updating those um, as soon as we're ready to start making changes. Um, but a lot of our stuff that just lives on websites, we have to prepare to update them, but we're actually updating them the upgrade weekend um, because a lot of that we don't want live before people are actually using it. Um, as well as um, uh, videos. So we uh, flag which of our videos are going to be made uh, obsolete by the upgrade. Um, and put those in the top of the queue for re redoing. Um, if any of you uh, go to our YouTube channel, you will notice that we have some that are a few versions out of date um, because videos take a long time to do. Uh, so we're continually updating our videos um, with each upgrade uh, and usually focusing on the pieces that we know are, uh, you know, going to be most important to people or the things that we get the most questions about. Um, the one other thing that we do um, related to our upgrade and our training and resources is we put an upgrade page on our uh, main uh, BC Libraries cooperative website, um, which we link the resources and the training session signups to um, and build that page out as we get closer to the upgrade. Um, and we also include a preview page there. So a list of the new features and bug fixes to highlight um, so that libraries can start knowing what's coming um, since our documentation doesn't go live until the upgrade, upgrade itself. Um, Gina or Elizabeth, did you have anything you wanted to say about uh, the training and resources your consortia do? I would say the only difference is we let um, all of our documentation is on um, released ahead of time. So that for those who are testing, we'll have that documentation to look at. And also some of our libraries like to print things out and have it ready for that go live morning. So rather than having them um, have to go and find it, they like to, to PDF it and print it out. So um, other than that, I think we're very similar, but I will you know, say videos take forever and they're my least favorite thing. <laughs> so. Sorry, um, I had nothing to add there. <laughs> um, and here we have uh, just as an example, um, this is the training and resources that we either create or update with every one of our upgrades. Um, so you can see it's not a short list. Um, but I think the time that we put into updating the documentation doing the training sessions, doing the videos um, makes a difference um, in the questions that we get after the upgrade. Um, as you know, people are able to find the resources they need. They're not surprised by big new features. Um, we, I mean, we get questions. We get people who didn't realize something was changing. Every now and then after an upgrade, we also get somebody reporting something's not working the way it used to, which hasn't changed. Um, and I think it's because, you know, they're expecting things to change. Um, so sometimes, yeah, there's a, occasionally things where it's like, that actually hasn't changed in four versions. Um, 
but yeah, I think the, you know, the time we put into the training and the resources um, is well worth it in uh, not keeping support tickets down, but I think we would get a lot more tickets if we didn't do the work ahead. Um, and now we're going to go back to Gina for the upgrade day. Yeah, I hope that meme uh, makes people laugh because update uh, upgrade day could be kind of scary, especially if you've never done it before. Um, thanks, Susan. <laughs> uh, it, especially like if you've never done it before, um, it's usually better just to go with somebody else who's done it. Uh, cause like there, there's some things that could come up in a production based, uh, server environment when you're doing an upgrade, that's not going to be similar to a test server. Uh, so I just kind of go through as quickly since I know we're kind of near the end of this. Um, so you have to shut your services down, cron jobs, uh, that basically just like send out messages and all the other good stuff that's involved with that um, also need to be shut off. And uh, for us, uh, we don't have cron jobs running on test servers. Uh, so, you know, that's one example that might be different from a production and test server uh, environment. Um, staging of your config files, I uh, mentioned that once before. So that's like files like, um, oh, geez. They all escape me at, the, at this moment. I don't know why, but like anything that... Um, you know, like uh, th those like files that you go into, like EG config. Um, if you have to like do anything to turn bootstrap on, TPAC off, things like that. Um, that's an example of a config file. So I tried to do those first uh, just because typically it's not really part of the install, uh, but I save it as like a new file. So then later on, I could just move it into uh, the original state. Um, and we also have a backup of it. So uh, then there's a database uh, backups and upgrades. As I mentioned, that typically takes the longest, at least for us. Uh, so the time uh, portion that you could add before your uh, psql commands when you run the up the, uh, upgrade scripts um, on a test server will give you at least like a when it's complete um, a good idea of like how what kind of time that you're looking at, especially if you're running a lot of different uh, scripts. Um, and so that's going to be important when you schedule stuff too and what to expect. Uh, upgrading resources, like we talked before, your OS, Postgres version, open surf. Uh, then there's the install. Uh, that does take a while. If you do happen to have um, like a multi-server production type of environment, I know for us, we have about like eight bricks that um, the Evergreen stuff just runs on both the OPAC side and the staff side. Um, and that takes a long time to get through. Because you got to compile um, your Angular JS files, your Angular files, Bootstrap. It's just like a small portion of what you're doing with the install. Uh, and then, of course, there's a post uh, install task uh, like SQL. Um, there might be like uh, some type of feature that needs to have SQL uh, involved. I know for us, for the geolocation, um, there was a lot of stuff that I saved in SQL just so uh, when we test it out on the test server, great, that works. Um, I'm just going to save it as a SQL so we could just do begin, run through it, commit. And then we have basically that um, setting applied to production uh, along with anything else that probably has to um, be edited, like um, the whole user settings. I remember that being something that needed to be looked at before. Uh, it was some time ago, so no specifics for me on that. Uh, look at your global flags, library settings, anything in the GUI that um, you know has to be adjusted, especially when you have new features. So good example of this, your circulation experimental version, you're going to have to flip a library setting for that to make it go on. Uh, maybe some user permissions also have to be looked at, um, like access. Uh, I think, I think uh, th there is actually like a permission you have to put in, if I'm not mistaken, to access certain modules of Evergreen, um, like the experimental circ. Uh, so you'll have to remember to put that. So having a list of that to run through your post install tasks um, is important. Uh, Third-party services, it was mentioned before uh, that they should be notified when an upgrade happens. Um, so if you have to get in touch with them again when an upgrade is finished, uh, I typically don't do that because that's really up to our director of user services to do. Um, but that's just like another task that is a little bit outside of just evergreen-based things that you have to like have a team involved in when you do the upgrade day stuff, especially when you're done with the install. 
Uh, and then doing some preliminary testing and then announcing that the server is ready. I feel like Jennifer probably has a better example of this because they have like a whole team usually involved in that. Uh, it's like with us, it's a little bit more ad hoc. Um, I like to just make sure that any of the bug fixes that are featured, um, new features too, with like going from what the production version was into the new one is actually implemented in there. And then making sure that like those everyday tasks, like circulation, searching for things, um, is going, uh, and having like a networking person who's also able to take a look at your resources. Uh, did you mean, unfortunately it didn't work out so much for us. Uh, so we're looking forward to, uh, an upgrade on that, but, um, we didn't really notice that that was like a really draining our resources until someone from uh, networking told us about it. Um, and sometimes that's hard to do, uh, when you're doing a testing environment versus production. Uh, so that that's just basically like a, a gist of what an upgrade day or night looks like for me. Um, I'll just add that for third-party services, we actually run a separate authentication server while we're down um, so that all of the authentication of our third-party services keeps going and the patrons, as far as like OverDrive, LinkedIn Learning, um, other resources like that, the patrons don't know that something's happening because everything's still working for them. Um, we didn't used to do that um, back in the early days of our upgrades, um, but I think we've been doing that for, I was going to say five years, but that only takes us back to like 2019, 2020. Um, so I think it might be more like seven, eight, nine, ten years that we've now been running an authentication uh, server. Um, and it definitely lessens the impact of the upgrade on um, the library's patrons um, because it's just the library system per se that doesn't actually currently work. Um, and one thing I didn't mention before is we have a lot of libraries that are closed on Sunday, Monday, um, which is why we do the Saturday night into Monday morning. Um, because some we, we have a good number of libraries that are affected because they're open, but we have a large number of libraries that that's just the days of the week that they're closed. All right, so now you have reached the end of your upgrade. You've, you're now live on production and all your end users are using the new version. Hooray, everyone is happy. Uh, but then unfortunately you get the feedback. <laughs> so how do you deal with that? Um, you know, there are the unexpected bugs, things that you could not have anticipated uh, during testing. Um, obviously your server performance and production is different than your testing servers. So things are different. Uh, you know, just the sheer amount of activity that's taking place is not the same when you're testing. So you don't always catch everything, not a big deal, but how do you deal with that? Um, you know, the did you mean for us did not work when it was installed the first time, we just saw some slowdown. And so we were, you know, chatting with Equinox to get additional info. We were chatting with other people who um, also upgraded recently. So, you know, trading bug info has always been very helpful. Kind of having that um, upgrade buddy, you know, tell us what you encountered and maybe we encountered it too. Um, that was very helpful for us. Also reporting bugs to the community and emailing the listserv is very helpful. Um, and things like that we did not anticipate to be a big issue, like when the print template or the the holds pull list moved from the workstation <laughs> uh, print templates to the server side. We did not anticipate that being an issue and it became one of the bigger bigger issues in our more recent upgrades. And we were like, wow, I had no idea people were printing this on receipt printers, like did not consider that. So um, just having that ability to quickly uh, resolve those issues and just get the info out again, relying on your modes of communication to uh, your community, your community uh, locally uh, is very helpful. So the fact that they know that the upgrade is coming and they've helped test, you know, it really helps keep things smooth. And, um, you know, when you're, when you hit those unexpected ones, it's, it's not as bad. 
Gina or Jennifer, do you have anything? Um, well, I would add to that around the, the feedback with talking about other uh, consortia, it, you know, tie back into what we were talking about right at the beginning about the advantages of doing an upgrade is being in sync with community members. Um, we're always really excited when we learn that somebody's going to a version before us. Um, because there's been some versions where we're the first. Um, and it's always very helpful to learn from the bugs that somebody else reports right after going live on that version, because there's always something, you know, not necessarily something big, but, you know, as you said, you know, something small, or at least something we thought was small, like the whole um, pull list, um, can become a very big issue for the libraries when it disrupts their, you know, day-to-day -day workflow. Um, and so it's really helpful to be, you know, watching Launchpad, watching the list serves. Um, and the other place that I often learn about some of this stuff is through the interest groups too. Um, all, uh, so different things that people are running into in acquisitions or, you know, sometimes just learning that somebody's planning to go to X version at this time and you're like, okay, they're going to be testing the version at the same time as us. I think, uh, Elizabeth, it, it might have been Pales the other year where we were like, okay, if we go live in October and Pales is going live in November, we're going to be first, but they're going to be testing at the same time. So, you know, there's more people potentially to encounter the same uh, or encounter the issues and catch things that our organizations might not catch. Um, so I think, you know, that's very, very helpful because it can be a little scary to be the first one sometimes. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> Gina, did you have anything you wanted to add? Okay. Uh, nope. Great. So that kind of wraps up our, you know, scheduling and planning your upgrade. Uh, are there any questions, comments that people would like to share? And while people are thinking, I'll just say, hopefully this session has demonstrated that, you know, the community, at least I speak for the three of us, you know, we're happy to talk about our upgrades and what we do and how we do it. Um, so, you know, if if you're wanting to do an upgrade, but there's a piece of it that you're unsure of, or you're, you know, it seems like a huge thing, um, please reach out. I mean, we're we're happy as as this session hopefully has demonstrated. We're happy to talk about the upgrades and and what's involved for our organizations. And I think during this uh, putting this session together, all three of us came, you know, took things from what each other were saying about like, oh, well, I'm going to take that back for my next upgrade because we don't do that, but that would be really useful. I don't know if anybody's willing to share, but does anybody have an upgrade coming up in the next few months? Uh, we do have a question from Jane. In the meantime, uh, could I hear more about the authentication server at Sitka? Also, are there other ways that the three of you keep certain services available during the downtime? Um, I'm going to say uh, if you're interested in our authentication server, please email me because I know we have it and I know it works, but I will need to ask our tech what we actually do. <laughs> Um, and I will just put my email into the chat there. I was also thinking it was a SIP server as well, Blake. Um, I believe it is a copy of, like, it's just a copy of production that just runs authentication. Wow. <clears throat> Yeah, we, we run SIP over at Biblio for uh, authentication. 
Um, but yes, please, uh, <clears throat> if that's something you're interested in, uh, send me an email and I will ask our tech for uh, an explanation that I can pass along. Well, I think we timed this quite quite well. We're five minutes to the end of the session. Not bad. <laughs> Thank you, Britta. And yeah, everybody enjoy your evenings. Um, I'm going to go do lunch. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, like, enjoy your afternoon <laughs> over in PT land. <laughs> Thank you to all of you. I don't see any other questions in chat. So um, everybody have a great evening and we'll see you all tomorrow. <laughs>